Hey everyone, welcome in to a, another daily editorial here on the KE Report. In this daily editorial, I am getting an update from Graphene Manufacturing Group, traded on the TSX Venture Exchange under the symbol GMG. I am chatting again with Craig Nickel, the founder and CEO of Graphene Manufacturing Group. I just had an interview with Craig, I think it was just about a week ago, where we dove into a lot of questions on the graphene production out of the company, as well as the battery division. We are going to be shifting focus a little bit to uh, another division, the Thermal XR division. Now, as we've talked about it in the past, we recently had some news yesterday, December 20th, that shares with us some new data on the verified now improved heat transfer on aluminum with this Thermal XR. Studies have shown now that uh, when the Thermal XR is applied to aluminum surfaces, it reduces surface temperature by approximately 15% in temperatures between 70 degrees Celsius and 90 degrees Celsius. Craig, make sense of this. Why is this so important for this division moving forward? Thanks, Corey. Great to be back on. Look, this is a, it's a complicated release because uh, it needs to be understood in, in both the context of the product, uh, the technology we use, and also in its ability to be applied into industry. So let me just walk you through it. Um, what we're doing here is we're coating one side of uh, a piece of aluminium and then putting that in a, a, a controlled temperature, which then as we increase the temperature up and down, we're tracking the temperatures of these particular pieces of aluminium. And what we're noticing is, and over a sustained number of trials, is that the heat moves through the piece with the aluminium out of something like 15% faster um, and then drops the temperature something about 15% lower on the internal side of these both pieces of aluminium. So um, <clears throat> that's um, really a significant step forward. Um, so if you were to have any normal type of coating, even a black coating, a barbecue paint, for instance, it shouldn't do that. Um, there should be a, a small increase in the radiation of the energy through the black paint, but typically the insulating effect of that coating would mean it would probably be still a slower outcome um, and it would would genuinely not move heat faster. Typically, physics tells you that when you put in an insulating layer over a per material, it will actually move slower. And here we are putting an insulating layer, which is our thermal XR, and we're actually moving heat faster. So something else is going on. We've seen this in our work for some years now, and it's taken us a lot of work to be able to do define the exact experiment and then get the repeatability show that it works continually in this range and then go and come and get one of the best universities in the world university of queensland to verify it so extremely happy about this step for the energy savings business it's really something to behold and stand back and think if you can shift heat faster on so many applications in the world there is so many opportunities to reduce energy and and that's of course what our main game is so so that's the first bit around you know the technology and what this means and it's it's a big thing you know there potentially could be physics books that need to be rewritten about this um, and we're more than happy for people to come and study it <laughs> the second area is okay where can it be applied and and that that's really we're just starting to open this up the applications in, in air conditioning is, are, are quite well known for us. We've been working on, on our demonstration centre uh, for some time, and we've seen that we've done a number of projects around the world which show that when we coat the um, air conditioning coil, which is the condenser coil, which is the one outside, typically we can shift heat faster. And typically if the air conditioner has the ability to take that efficiency on it will reduce its energy bill and so we've shown that a number of times and then we started to show it on new equipment and 
there are some things you need to have into account. Like you, you need to have uh, the ability for the air conditioner to take that new uh, condenser coil efficiency on. And sometimes the new air conditioners um, can't take that. And so that's an important point to note. And we've found that, that it, the only some brand new air conditioners can actually use the efficiency because there are other things going on. You've got the compressor and you have the, um, the evaporator coil on the inside. And so those things are designed around a certain operating system parameters. And when you actually increase the efficiency of the condenser coil, sometimes that doesn't go all the way through, but sometimes it does. And so that's the interesting thing. But in other areas, it can be very, very useful to increase heat transfer. Almost all uh, heat, tr heat processes that go on in big industrial plants, um, are almost all power generation have heat transfer uh, controlled or limited plants as well. And then, you know, there, there are big uh, company, the big industries like uh, liquefied natural gas, which is it's, it's almost solely you know, limited by um, uh, the heat transfer efficiencies uh, of, of aluminium at or around 70 to 90 degrees C. So there are, there are some areas that we know we, we're talking to already, and we said in the release, we're already talking to big companies who could potentially use this on their equipment. But what we also know is that there are many other types of applications in industries that, that we're just starting to become aware of. So that, that is something that we're really excited about. There's lots of opportunity to work in this space. This is a product that's palletized, ready to be sold. It is already being sold around the world. Um, and so whilst it's very much focused for us on HVAC uh, distributors and building that network up in around the world, we're also looking at very direct B2B large industries that can use this coding to make massive reductions in their energy consumption and, and emissions as well. So that's another part of our, you know, another feather in our cap, if you like. So that's what we really hope to 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 commercialize and, and build on next year. So Craig, give us a bit of a roadmap here then, because this sounds like an important update for even expanding the current market, but where do you stand in the market? How do you get more sales? What does that look like for next year? Yeah, so when, when we've been talking to, to um, various different you know, opportunities or potential customers in this space, I think Sometimes it's a bit hard for people to necessarily understand that we can shift heat faster with just a simple, you know, five micron thick coating with graphene in it. So um, this type of data really helps us. So we can publicly say now this data shows that we can show at least 15% in this temperature with aluminium. But what we know is it's it gets higher above the 90 degrees. We haven't validated that, so we've got to work on that. And... And it gets even higher above 200 degrees, but we've still got to validate that and we've got to go and work on that. So that's going to be the stepping stone to show we can do other temperature ranges. And then we also know it, it, the, the improvement we see, it varies on other materials. So we're working on copper right now. So how much can you improve the heat transfer on copper? And our copper is wholly limited in heat transfer for its electrical transmission. So if we can increase heat transfer on copper, we can probably have, allow more electrical, I guess, current or capacity through the same copper. So it means you can utilize one of the one of the most amazing materials out there, which is copper, for more applications or more more capacity, just with a very fine fine coating of our of our coating of, of our graphene of uh, thermal XR. And then there's obviously steel, uh, stainless steel. And, and I'm sure one day we'll also get to test uh, other products like uh, plastics and such things. So taking the heat out of them faster can mean that they can operate at higher temperatures that they typically can't right now. So whilst we've just done a range of temperatures, you would argue a small range for 70 to 90 degrees, but that's often where these heat exchanges work in the industry. And we can show a 15% improvement in heat transfer but what this means is we've got a plethora of materials temperature ranges and different operating settings that we can now 
um, work through and test and validate and and look at how that coding could be applied in other large industrial applications where heat is right now the biggest controlling factor. So that's what we aim to do, but it would be data-led customer inquiries. So we, we produce the data with the customer and then we work with them on how we can sell them the product. And I think what we'll find is there'll be more uh, applications for this product than we currently can even dream of. <laughs> and and that's what's really, really exciting because, you know, as a result now, we've now owed the the product, we own the mixing, we own the IP in the product, and we, are, and we make the graphene and we make the product. So uh, we have the full value chain in this particular uh, business opportunity and um, the full value is then able to be maximised um, to be able to get it into the markets that, that probably need it more than others. Um, so this data will enable us to progress sales in our mind just faster um, and then progress business opportunities that we were previously talking to. Um, also, we believe that will progress that as well and get more definition for the potential customer as well. So, Craig, if we're talking about all these other markets here that sound like they could be limitless, how long will it take to get into these markets? You said it'll be data driven, but what's the time frame on something like that? Yeah, and that'll be up to the OEMs, no doubt. Um, there's going to be some really interesting conversations where some OEMs will be a bit hesitant. So I, I don't want to see that kind of product on my thing without years of testing. And other OEMs will say, oh, look, I'll, I, I really want to work with you on how, how do I make that happen? And I think, you know, we can work out a fast space to be able to get this to market and improve people's energy bills. So that, that'll be the interesting thing. Which OEMs want to step up and help? Because it also, it also limits or stops corrosion as well. And that's going to be the interesting defining factor because let's just say corrosion helps some manufacturers when, <laughs> you know, suddenly they, you know, you, know, you, you, you your, your piece of equipment, whatever it might be, just doesn't work anymore because it's corroded. You need to go buy another one. Um, so ours will severely reduce, just almost stop that um, over a very long period of time. So, how they respond with that as well is going to be something um, they'll need to work through. So it'll be who, which OEMs and which markets and which applications and which countries really see this as an advantage. But you, your big energy producers have really no downside in this. That I think that's the thing. Um, and, and so likely will be brought more into a B2B market because that they, it's really just upside for them. They get a reduced bill. Um, reduced emissions, and they can say that they're doing something green as well. So we'll see how the market plays out next year, but the scene is set for some very interesting conversations, and, and we hope, you know, we obviously hope we'll drive those sales um, in this market with this data now. So if this is truly a, a product that can go to a wide range of markets, to a wide range of businesses and users, what does it take to actually apply this coding? Is there any special training needed? Give us some more insights on this angle, please. Yeah, so it's using uh, a number of different ways of spraying it, but it's a, it's commonly called an airless sprayer um, is used, um, which is a very low cost, usually down a $50 type kit. And you just pour that into the kit and, 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 and you spray it a very thin um, coating. As I said, five microns are super thin. There are on existing corroded aluminium copper parts. We have two other um, parts of the system which you coat onto it, and one's to clean it and one's to remove the corrosion, and the third one is also to then obviously apply the graphene. So those those are already there in the kit as well. But on brand new equipment, often you don't have to do the first two. You can just jump to the graphene coating, then super easy. Obviously, you'd take the normal safety precautions with coatings. It's, it's a water-based coat, so it's a, what I would suggest is a, a um, quite an environmentally friendly coating, uh, non-hazardous good, uh, non-dangerous good uh, product, which is also really good as well, uh, to, easy to ship. Uh, it's, it's quite easy to use. We, we've got YouTubes on it, um, and you know, it's, in terms of coating, it's basically a normal coating that you would 
apply um, from from a normal uh, coding company. So, Craig, I guess I need to ask then, when it comes to balancing out this Thermal XR division with the battery division, how are you going to do that? How do you allocate the graphene that you are already are producing? Yeah, and that's uh, that's 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 the next interesting step is how do you allocate the the growth of uh, both you know, people capital um, and and graphene production? And I think it's fair to say next year we've probably got a halfway split um, right now, planning between graphene for thermal XR and G lubricants, which is another growing product opportunity which we will talk about eventually Corey um, in detail and then obviously with batteries so with that in mind um, really the, the the effort and time in our team and production goes to goes to sales so with more customer inquiries and sales and growth in different markets we will um, basically allocate more production and more <laughs> Um, and more money and effort into that um, at, at, at that particular time with an overall plan of keeping them all moving along. So really it's going to be customer-led um, and then provide that opportunity to to see which which way our customers are, um, are pushing on, on different parts of their business and then work with them to make it happen for them. Um, so, we, yeah, we remain completely market-focused. Market Okay. Well, Craig, uh, that covers a lot of the details in this news release. I'll post a link to the news release. I already have received a couple of questions on the battery division after our last interview. So please, everyone, keep sending those questions in. I did want to focus this interview on that Thermal XR division because it seems like this news release is very important for that division and continuing to move it into a bit of a higher revenue supporter of the company here. So please, everyone, keep sending me your questions. In full disclosure, I am a shareholder of the Graphene Manufacturing Group, and I'll follow up with Craig as some more news hits the market. Craig, again, thank you very much for your time and this update. Thanks, Corey. Talk again soon.